Hi, and welcome back to our what's going to be our last lecture uh, within the series from 375 at, B at BU. Um, so what I want to do in this last lecture is give a short introduction to the idea of Bayes' theorem and, and what Bayesian statistics is. So if you remember way back in the beginning of the course, we were talking in one lecture about data management and data analysis. And I kind of mentioned uh, these two guys, uh, Bayes and Fisher, who are in many ways kind of fathers of two different but competing fields uh, of thought within statistics. And between this early lecture and now, we've covered a lot of the ideas listed on this slide of, of data visualization, statistics, model data comparison, and model interpretation data interpretation. And we did that primarily from this maximum likelihood principle that Fisher was a strong advocate for in which a lot of our classic uh, statistical tests like ANOVA are derived from. So what is Bayes and where does it come from? And what are kind of some of the pluses and minuses of thinking about Bayes? So first, uh, to set up Bayes, I'm going to come back to the idea of the likelihood and talk about some of the possible critiques and concerns with likelihood estimation. So as a reminder, our likelihood is the probability of observing a given data point uh, conditional on a parameter value theta. So we are th always thinking about a likelihood as the probability of generating a data point given a model. And from that idea of what a likelihood is, we derived estimators using what was called the likelihood principle. A parameter value is more likely than another if it is one for which the data are more probable. That was the basis for everything learned about Mac, uh, Bayesian, uh, sorry, everything we learned about maximum likelihood and that all of the other things we did before maximum likelihood came from uh, that. It's also, you know, what we've been seeing more recently with more complicated models that you know, we can still fit more complicated models and process-based models to data as long as we can write down a likelihood. But there are some possible critiques of likelihood. So one is that likelihood by itself gives you a point estimate, your maximum likelihood estimate. And then doing anything with that maximum likelihood estimate requires that you make additional assumptions if we want to estimate the uncertainty. So if we want to test a hypothesis, say that a slope is bigger than zero or two things are different from each other, we can't do that from the maximum likelihood estimates alone because they're always different. We need to invoke um, you know, some estimate of the uncertainties. And we did that in this class, primarily focusing on bootstrapping. And so there's this extra step and these extra set of assumptions about our ability to, in that case, generate um, different replicate data sets from the original data set. And I also should note that bootstrapping isn't the only way to get uncertainties in, in maximum likelihood. There are multiple competing ways that make slightly different assumptions that we can use to derive uh, different estimators of the uncertainties. They tend to give similar answers, but the point is that you need, you always need to make additional assumptions to estimate the uncertainties with maximum likelihood and you need to do additional computations to get there. Second, let's just stop back and think, step back and think about what the likelihood is actually giving us. It's giving us the probability of our data conditional on some specific choice of model or model parameters. And is asking, is that really the question that we have when we're working with models and data? I would you know, argue that maybe what we're actually usually interested in isn't the probability of our data. We already have our data. We don't need to know the probability of our data. We're actually might more often interested in the probability of our model. Uh, so why are we not working with the probability of the model given the data, which in many ways is more intuitively related to what we think we might want. We might want to know, you know, what's the probability uh, that this parameter is different from zero. You know, that's kind of what you would intuitively think of when you are asking a, a hypothesis test about a model. 
And the fact that the likelihood is not the probability of the model given the data, but instead the probability of the data given the model leads to a number of kind of tortured definitions that are common in frequentist statistics that are, are, are potentially prone to misinterpretation. And so we think about things like the p-value. The p-value is the probability of obtaining results at least as extreme as the observed results of a statistical hypothesis test, assuming that the null hypothesis is correct. It is not the probability that this thing is, you know, correct. It, you know, it's, it's a very tortured definition. Uh, it's convoluted, it's hard to remember, and it's even harder to think about. And more problematic, people often substitute what a p-value actually is to what they want it to be, the probability of the, of the test. Um, similarly, comps intervals are the fraction of intervals calculated from a large number of data sets generated by the same process that would include the true parameter value. So when we talk about constant intervals, we're talking about frequencies of intervals, of, uh, you know, what's the frequency that intervals with similar data sets would include the true parameter value. It's not the probability that, you're not saying with a 95% constant interval that you're 95% sure that the, uh, that the value falls in that interval. And, and more to the point, if you could calculate the probability of the model given the data, then you could do things like say, what's the probability that the true value falls in this interval? What's the probability that this value is bigger than zero, less than zero, you know, do kind of those tests. So these, these kind of convoluted definitions come from the fact uh, that, we can, that we've been thinking about the probability of the data, not the probability of the model. So let's take a look at an example of how that can lead us astray. So imagine that we have uh, three different experiments and they represent three different, you know, uh, the different levels of plausibility for, for hypotheses. So let's say before the experiment, is carried out, we have our long shot hypothesis. You know, let's say there's 19 to one odds against that. Um, so there's a 95% chance there's no real effect, 5% that it's real. Toss up, you know, our, our prior information that's coming from uh, previous experiments, conjectured mechanisms, other expert knowledge. Let's say, you know, based on all the knowledge up to date, we have a 50-50 chance that this thing is true. And let's say all the knowledge up to now says, uh, we're pretty sure this is true. Let's see, the data to now says it's a 90 to 10, nine and one odds in favor. Um, then we measure a p-value, you know, from data collected along that and should note that, a, you know, in the long shot chance, if you get a p-value of 0.05, um, there's only 11% chance that that's real and an 89% chance that there's no effect. So essentially, if you thought that this was a probability that your uh, hypothesis was true, you get something that says you're 95% sure your hypothesis is true, when in reality, there's only 11% chance that it's true. Even a 50-50 chance, you know, you know, uh, a significant p-value, 0.05, only corresponds to a 71% chance of that hypothesis being true. And it's only when the odds are, are highly in favor of the hypothesis being true that we get something closer to what we expected, which is, you know, in this case, with a nine to one odds in favor, a p-value of 0.05 corresponds to a 96% chance uh, that the hypothesis is true. So, you know, that this, you know, and, and this figure also gives, 
you know, corresponding values to the additional hypothesis tests, you know, say a 0.01 alpha level instead, you know, even when we have a higher alpha level, you know, we don't really get these things representing the probabilities that we think they do. And this is again, because what we're calculating here is about the probability of a test statistic independent of any prior knowledge. And here's what we're th thinking about in terms of the actual probabilities of those hypotheses. And sometimes that's important. You know, if you, if in these long shot cases, you know, uh, as the famous saying from Cargill Sagan goes, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So we wouldn't want to, you know, accept uh, a hypothesis that is, is pretty implausible. Uh, when, you know, based on a little bit of data, when it's quite possible that the, the single data set we have occurred by chance, we want to be able to couch uh, that in the, in the context of previous information. And so that's kind of one of the kind of key flaws here. Is not only is the p-value not uh, able to really tell us what the probability of the test is, because that's not what it's doing. Uh, it is kind of subject to, to misinterpretation because it does not account for this prior information. Um, so this leads us to some questions. Uh, how can we incorporate prior information in our analyses? How do we calculate the probability of the model given the data? And if we could do that, does it give us more intuitive statistics, such as the probability asking, you know, the probability that a hypothesis is correct or probability that a true parameter falls within an interval? And so that's going to set us up for so the short answer with Bayes is yes. Uh, and we're going to next dive into kind of where that comes from.